Welcome to the 2022 HVAC Excellence Conference. This is a recorded presentation. It is entitled Methods to Electronically Control Refrigerated Cases. Refrigeration systems have become more sophisticated over the years with the use of EEBs, EEPRs, and the appropriate electronic controllers. The controllers can be standalone or integrated into the building's energy management system. Generally, the controllers and many system parameters can be monitored remotely with the appropriate components in place. In this presentation, we will discuss standalone and integrated controllers. These controllers can manage system temperature and pressure and can be designed to control lights, defrost, fans, and anti-sweat heaters. Some big supermarket retailers are deploying more of these methods. And these retailers are requiring pre-qualification of their service technicians regarding these system controllers. For the sake of history, we've included a summary of the development of refrigeration. That might be interesting. And we will also discuss several traditional methods of temperature control in refrigeration systems simply for reference. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. Your participation will set the stage for your readiness to train students. The Sporland Division of Parker Hannafin is sponsoring this presentation. Sporlin is a leading manufacturer of HVAC and R components with quality materials and craftsmanship, commitment to innovation and manufacturing excellence, all while providing exceptional service and support for customers. Their complete line of products include catch-all filter dryers, thermostatic expansion valves, solenoid valves, pressure regulating valves, suction filters, electric valves, controllers, supermarket monitoring solutions, chemical smart service tools, Zoom Lock Max, press to connect, and Zoom Lock Push, push to connect refrigerate, refrigerant fittings. Ultimately, we are engineering breakthroughs for a better tomorrow. Hello, I'm Jim Jansen, Senior Application Engineer for the Sporland Division of Parker Hannafin Corporation. Currently, I'm involved with training newly hired sales and technical personnel. And I am the co-host for our supermarket series of webinars. Here is the basic vapor compression refrigeration cycle. It has four primary components, the compressor, the condenser, some kind of metering device and the evaporator. The four sides of the trapezoid that you see depicted here represent the four basic components in a vapor compression cycle. Here it is superimposed upon a pressure enthalpy diagram. The compressor right here, where the pressure and temperature of the refrigerant vapor are increased to form the high side of the system. The condenser that you see here is where the heat is rejected from the refrigerant to the ambient or reclaimed as the refrigerant condenses back to a liquid. The expansion device, depicted here as a thermostatic expansion valve, that's where the refrigerant undergoes the drop in pressure back down to the low side of the system with an accompanying drop in temperature as well. And then here, the evaporator, where the heat removal process begins while the refrigerant changes state to a vapor and the low temperature saturated refrigerant liquid boils, all the while removing heat from whatever you want to cool, chill, or freeze only to re-enter the compressor and start the process all over. In addition to these four primary components, the system includes the refrigerant, lubricant, and all the interconnecting tubing or piping. This is the most widely used type of mechanical refrigeration system in the world today. It preserves food for future use, keeps us cool and dry in places that aren't. Heat is transferred from a low temperature thing or place to make that thing or place cool, cold, or frozen. The heat is then transferred to a high temperature environment and either reclaimed or discarded. This is no easy task and it consumes energy to make it happen. But these systems are scalable, efficient, historically reliable, and simply everywhere in our modern world. I'd hate to try to do without them. The vapor compression refrigeration, ugh, 
refrigeration cycle, don't leave home without it. Prior to the widespread availability of mechanical refrigeration, block ice was harvested from lakes, ponds, and rivers. It was stored and delivered to be used to move or transfer heat, or refrigerate, if you will. Quarries and caves were sometimes used to store the harvested ice. It would be packed in sawdust or straw to act as insulation to preserve the ice into the warmer months of the year. Even as large industrial mechanical refrigeration systems capable of producing ice became increasingly commonplace, the daily delivery of block ice remained prevalent, particularly in larger communities. Block ice was placed in an ice box in the home to refrigerate and preserve fresh foods. Well after mechanical domestic refrigerators became widely available, they were often still referred to as ice boxes. The term ton in the refrigeration industry corresponds to the use of ice to refrigerate or move heat. The cooling produced by melting one ton of ice in one day is referred to as one ton of refrigeration. It has been calculated that 288,000 BTUs are required to melt one ton of ice in one day. Said another way, this is 12,000 BTUs per hour. BTU being the British thermal unit of measure. Here is an example of that basic refrigeration cycle in an action in the form of a DX multiplex rack. It looks quite complicated, but just remember, there are only four primary components in the system, and we'll be discussing some of the specific components within this area of that very system. Some supermarkets control the flow of refrigerants to each case, refrigerated case that is, solely based on a need for cooling. This is the solenoid valve and thermostat method. With this method, when the case temperature increases above set point, the thermostat tells the solenoid valve to open by means of some control system gymnastics, as I call them, the refrigerant flows to the metering device. The metering device is depicted as a thermostatic expansion valve or TEV in this example. And the metering device controls the flow of refrigerant to the evaporator. When the temperature is achieved and the thermostat is satisfied, the solenoid valve will subsequently close. This is one of the most basic temperature control schemes. This setup is more commonly used on small standalone conventional systems, such as walk-in freezers or coolers. However, it could be used on these multiplex systems. As a side note, a variation of this method is also used on many basic residential air conditioning systems. A solenoid valve is an electrically operated device with the primary purpose to control the flow of fluids, liquid, or vapor in a refrigeration system. A solenoid valve is operated by opening and closing an orifice or port in a valve body that permits or prevents flow through the valve. It is controlled by an electrical current running through a solenoid coil, hence the name. When the coil is energized, a magnetic field is created causing the plunger in the valve to move in an open or closed position depending on the design of the solenoid valve. Solenoid valves can be installed in a number of locations in a refrigeration system, whether it be the liquid line, hot gas bypass line, suction line, or other places. The model of solenoid valve to use in this application certainly depends on the required function, flow capacity, and type of operation needed from the solenoid valve. And always remember, size matters. Solenoid valves should be sized with the proper port diameter for the valve flow capacity that is needed to meet the application requirement. Solenoid valves should never be sized based on tubing line size. The liquid line solenoid valve and a thermostat. In this example, the thermostat is wired in series with the compressor motor contact or coil. Look at the wiring di diagram that we've depicted here. This example depicts just one way to control a basic system such as this. 
there are many other ways to get the job done. When the thermostat setting is satisfied, it opens the electrical circuit and it also opens the compressor motor contactor and shuts off the compressor motor and closes the liquid line solenoid valve and stops the flow of refrigerant to the evaporator. Cycling a liquid line solenoid valve is relatively inexpensive, but there are potential problems which can make this method somewhat impractical. Rapid or frequent cycling can reduce the life of the solenoid valve. In addition, the temperature being controlled will only be as accurate as the controller or the thermostat that's being used. This is due to a certain amount of time lag and interaction with the metering device. Another potential problem is system piping vibration or the so-called water hammer effect that can take place. Also, note the presence of a dual pressure control in this, in this particular system. This is a safety device intended to disable the system if suction pressure gets to, too low or discharge pressure gets too high. And it's depicted right here. Here are examples of a few control devices that could be used as thermostats, ranging from the basic style of controller on the left to intermediate devices that could be standalone in their function or actually connected to a building automation system. A little more on that later. There are certainly a multitude of other devices on the market that could also serve this function. Well, how well does it work if you do this? Well, here's a log of data that was acquired on a system with a liquid line solenoid valve and thermostat as the control mechanism. It was on a medium temp application and the graph displays case temperature in degree Fahrenheit, as you see here, versus time. The set point was approximately 34 degrees. And as you can see, the temperature varies approximately plus or minus three degree F over time from roughly 31 to 37. If you are satisfied with that level of accuracy, this design may be perfectly acceptable for your application. We'll compare the performance of this method with other methods of temperature control in this presentation. Here's another way to control temperature with pressure regulators that simply control pressure. Evaporator pressure regulators control evaporator pressure. It's really just that simple. The refrigerant in the evaporator is saturated as a result of that fact. By controlling the pressure in the evaporator, the associated saturated temperature will ultimately result in the evaporator through this control method. This, there is a correlation between the saturation temperature in the evaporator and the discharge air temperature, or DAT as a, for short, or leaving evaporator temperature. The air conditioning guys would generally just call this supply air temperature. And this is based upon the heat transfer characteristics of the evaporator. Evaporator pressure regulators, or EPRs, are designed to provide a means of accurately maintaining evaporator pressure and a consistent temperature under varying evaporator load conditions. When evaporator load increases, this type of valve will open on a rise of inlet pressure above the set point of the mechanical EPR. There are many different types of evaporator pressure regulators available. The options include direct acting valves with standard adjustment ranges and fitting options, as you see here. There are externally piloted valves, uh, for example here, and internally piloted valves, as we depicted here and here. Both provide more capacity and include additional features as compared to the simpler direct acting versions. Or that's certainly normally the case. Many supermarkets use multiple evaporators piped to a common suction header, as you see depicted here. Here are two evaporators, here's the common suction. These evaporators can be operated at different temperatures for the various products being refrigerated. While this is a common application for pilot operated EPRs, depending upon the size of the system. A direct acting EPR will also do the trick as shown here. Here's the EPR. An EPR is likely required when the desired saturation temperature in an evaporator or group of evaporators is higher 
as compared to the saturation temperature corresponding to the common suction pressure. The mechanical EPR provides the flexibility to allow multiple evaporator systems to operate at different temperatures when piped to a common suction group. Here's an example of a pilot operated EPR. It uses discharged gas pressure to pilot the piston in the valve. Here's the pilot line in both of these valve examples. This requires access to a reliable source of discharge gas. In this example, we've tapped into this, into this header arrangement for the discharge gas. That means these pilot operated valves are typically not used with a so-called loop piping system. Why? Because the source of discharge gas is not likely available out on the store floor. Instead, this type of valve would typically be used with a circuit pipe design, and they would ultimately be located at the compressor rack in the mechanical room. Here's an example of internally piloted EPR that could be utilized with the so-called loop system. Direct acting or internally piloted EPRs are typically used on systems with the evaporator groups piped to a common liquid and suction line that has been looped throughout the store. The EPRs are installed in or near the refrigerated case in these systems. That means the EPRs are actually installed out on that store floor. Well, how does it work? Here's a log of data that was acquired on a system with a mechanical e evaporator pressure regulator or EPR. It was a, again, a medium temp system. The graph displays case temperature in degree F here on the vertical axis versus time on the horizontal axis. The set point in this example was approximately 36 degrees Fahrenheit. As you can see, the temperature varies approximately plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit over time, ignoring the spikes, which are representative of a defrost cycle. This tracks fairly consistently with the set point, as you can see. This is a very effective and efficient way to control temperature, but there are other methods as well. We have already discussed the solenoid valve and thermostats, the mechanical EPR. Remember that mechanical EPR responds to inlet pressure to obtain a desired case temperature. In comparison, the electrically actuated and electronically controlled EEPR responds to discharge air temperature to obtain that desired case temperature. The EEPR is generally a step motor driven valve that actually resembles an EEV. In comparison to the mechanical EPR, this option requires a controller to accept the discharge air temperature reading from a sensor. The controller then positions the EEPR. Here's the controller, here's the step motor style valve, and then you can see some of the sensors and transducers that are located in this system. By stepping the EEPR in the closing direction, the pressure will increase and cause the discharge air temperature to also increase. While the mechanical thermostatic expansion valve, as we depicted here, controls superheat at the bowl, which is its only function. Here's the TEV and here's the bulb. In this example, we have included a control device that is typically standalone in function. Here's the controller. In comparison to the EPR, this option requires a controller to accept the discharge air temperature reading from a sensor. The controller then positions the EEPR. By stepping the EPR in the closing direction, the pressure will increase and cause the discharge air temperature to also increase. Regarding controllers, there are many options for standalone controllers to drive the EEPR. Standalone simply means there is no supervisory panel or controller to tell it what to do or monitor the results. Some refrigerated case controls can operate as standalone controllers. However, EEPRs can be controlled by dedicated boards or case controls that communicate with the store's EMS or BAS. That's the energy management system or the building automation system in the building. 
This allows the technician to see and monitor case temperature, valve position, and the list goes on. This can take place from the controller or from even a remote location. And that's right. There's the provision for remote control when we start going down this path. With any of these controllers, choosing the right sensor or sensor is a key aspect of it. Multiple temperature sensor models are available. The 2K, 3K, and 10K thermistors and more. The surface sensors can be identified by their brass, brass housing, and the 10K is predominantly used on these types of control applications, and you can refer to some of these examples here on the slide. When needed, the appropriate pressure transducer could be selected based on the pressure range seen in the system, anywhere from 0 to 150 PSIG, 0 to 300, or 0 to 500 are some of the models that are available. Pressure transducers would normally be included in this setup when we're going to control superheat or any of a number of different pressures that we may have interest in controlling. There are many valves and controllers available within this product group. Here are some examples. While sometimes called electronic valves, most of these valves are in fact actually electrically actuated and electronically controlled. These valves can be used to not only control evaporator pressure, but also superheat, hot gas bypass, glyco glycol flow in a secondary application, and head pressure. They have the advantage of being less sensitive to the refrigerant installed in the system and can generally throttle down to lower levels as compared to the mechanical EPR and can be monitored and controlled remotely if the right controllers and components are in place on the job. Before we go any further, I think it, it is worthwhile to consider the use of these electric valves and the necessary controls. Why do this? I've already mentioned some of these reasons, but they bear to be emphasized. The commissioning process is much simpler. Key in or select the parameters and you're ready to go with these types of devices. The process to set superheat is potentially much more time consuming with the mechanical thermostatic expansion valve. There's no need to unload the case. If a refrigerant retrofit is performed, there's generally no need to change components provided the control is in place accommodates the new refrigerant. TVs are very refrigerant sensitive. The control range is also significantly wider compared to the mechanical version with less sensitive sensitivity to changes in weather and ultimately the load. And just try monitoring the case temperature remotely with a TV, but nothing's perfect. It needs a separate controller as we've mentioned with the sensors, a bunch of wire. Uh, it's more complex to install. There's more upfront costs. Uh, there is some potential marginal superheat performance improvement over the TV, but if the TV is properly installed and adjust, adjusted, it does a pretty good job. But that properly part is indeed important. Something that bears to be said too, TVs are wireless, always have been. They're nice, eloquent, eloquent superheat controls, but I'm digressing a bit here. Well, how well does this work? Here again is a log of data that was acquired on a system with electric evaporator pressure regulator. It was a medium temp system. This graph displays case temperature and degrees Fahrenheit on the vertical scale versus time on the horizontal scale. The set point in this situation was approximately 37 degrees Fahrenheit. As you can see, the temperature varies approximately plus or minus one half degree Fahrenheit over time. This tracks fairly consistently with the set point and it recovers fairly quickly after a defrost cycle. This is indeed a very efficient way to control temperature. We've discussed three methods of temperature control. Now let's discuss how EEVs can control discharge air temperature. 
Some controllers can control an EAV to not only a desired discharge air temperature, but they can also monitor the evaporator superheat. Superheat is a safety to protect the compressor from liquid damage. The common vapor compression refrigeration systems use, use this control method. There is concern that operating a case at common suction pressure will cause additional frost because there's no e EPR or EAPR in this particular situation, along with the odd frost patterns and potentially have humidity level in the case that might be objectionable or in, in either a high or a low level. Guess we'll see as future tests will likely lend data to the discussion on this matter, but we're gonna plow ahead with this. Here is a detailed view depicting recommended temperature sensor and pressure transducer locations with the suggested spacing between the components as you can see depicted here. We have included a variety of temperature sensors for the coil outlet, discharge air, return air, and defrost termination. Here's a detailed view depicting recommended temperature sensor and pressure transducer locations with the suggested spacing between components. We have included temperature sensors for the coil outlet, discharge air, return air, and defrost termination. And of course, we have also shown the pressure transducer. Once again, how well does it work? Here's a log of data that was required on a system with a four door freezer. The graph once again displays case temperature in degree Fahrenheit on the vertical scale versus time on the horizontal scale. As you can see here, the temperature varies approximately plus or minus one half degree over time. This tracks consistently with the set point and it recovers quickly from the defrost cycle. So once again, here's a very efficient way to control temperature. Time for a blatant Sporland Division commercial to promote product and sell stuff. Food retailers today have a really tough job. How do they maintain precise food temperatures, prevent food loss, and communicate with the building automation system? Well, the answer is easy. Use the Sportland S3C case control solution. S3C equals safety, security, and service for refrigerated cases and supermarket applications. Safety for consumers with precise temperature control of all food products. Security making sure things are under control no matter what with customized set points and available system monitoring to prevent food product loss. Service with customizable alarms and diagnostics, making for the best refrigeration system control possible, all while communicating with the building automation system. The Tech Check mobile app with Bluetooth provides a local connection for easy access to system information. Put a complete Sporlin package together with the S3C case controller, valve module, and display. We have already talked a little bit about standalone controllers, and we have started to talk about this other kind of controller that we're depicting here as well. This one can readily interface with the building EMS and control many uh, additional parameters. These electric valve controllers are classified as integrated controls or case controllers. And here's an example of such a control device. The case controller drives the EEV, the EEPR, and potentially the liquid line solenoid valve. It also has onboard relays to control lights, defrost cycles, fans, and anti-sweat heaters. We can even control a pulse width modulating solenoid valve that might be serving as an EEV as well. These case controllers are typically in communication with the energy management system for data storage. And I know these controllers are indeed special because this particular one can also operate as that standalone controller for added flexibility. Here's an example of an appropriate controller for the EEV and or EEPR that may be in the system. This controller drives the EEV, the EEPR, a liquid line solenoid valve is it's, if it's present, and it also has those onboard relays that I talked about. This control product line includes a case controller as we depicted, depicted here, a display module here, 
a valve module, which just basically extend, extends its capabilities so we can terminate additional devices. And they'll, they'll all support open protocol communication via things like BACnet and Modbus. These devices are designed to facilitate both installation and integration by the equipment manufacturer, the OEM, or a contractor in the field as a retrofit project. The controller will control all typical case functions and receive the desired sensor inputs and drive the EEV. This control method would, would allow the EEV to regulate superheat. The controller would also drive the optional liquid line solenoid valve to successive open and closed positions and open and close the EEV in order to control case temperature. This would be accomplished using the traditional cut in and cut out method. The liquid line solenoid valve is optional since refrigerant flow may actually be stopped by closing the EEV. But you know, in the event of a power outage, I kind of like the idea of the solenoid valve that we've depicted here. Um, and I'm not so sure about the optional part, but that's the user's call when it's all said and done. Here's the EEV. Then of course we've depicted the controller in a display up here. And here's the wiring diagram for this method of temperature control. Note, we have a power supply that we'll talk a little bit more later, the display module, the liquid line solenoid valve, which we've hidden over here, the EEV, temperature sensors, pressure transducer, and all the other control functions like fans, lights, defrost, contract, con contactor, et cetera. The valve module is essentially an extension of the case controller and expands the controller's capabilities. This provides for additional inputs and outputs like the control for two EEVs like you see here, or one EEV and one EEPR. And here it is needed for the second EEV. The case controller will control the typical case functions and collect the desired sensor inputs and drive EEV1 and the valve module will collect the necessary inputs for the second evaporator and drive EEV2. Again, the EEVs here will regulate superheat. The controller will pulse the optional liquid line solenoid valve through successive open and closed positions in conjunction with the EEV to control case temperature with the cut in cut out method. Typically coil out temperature sensors would be installed on each evaporator coil outlet with one pressure transducer on the common suction. And here's the wiring diagram for this example. The valve module, again, simply extends the input and output capability of the single case controller in this example. Take a close look and you will see EEV1 uh, sensors and pressure transducer terminations at the case controller across here. And likewise for EEV2 on the valve module over here. We have included the second pressure transducer to show this option how it would be terminated on the valve module versus one pressure transducer on the common suction. Now here's an example with not one but two and even up to three EEVs. And again here's an example of the wiring diagram. It gets a little more complicated, but overall, it's not terribly elaborate. And this is straightforward. And this kind of information is generally available in instruction manuals from any given manufacturer. Even though the EEB can influence both discharge air temperature and evaporator superheat, multiple evaporators running at temperature, temperatures above some common suction might just show enhanced performance if we included the EEPR. So here's the EEV, here's a solenoid valve, and here's the EEPR. The case controller will handle the normal case functions and receive the necessary sensor inputs for the EEV. The valve module will drive the EEPR. The EEPR will regulate discharge air temperature and the EEV will control superheat. The optional liquid line solenoid valve may be installed as one per case or one per lineup. Each case in the lineup could theoretically be fitted with its own EEPR and valve module. 
And guess what? Here's the detailed wiring diagram for this example. Now here's one of those components I said I'd discuss in a little more detail. It's the power supply. This is a necessary component. This is a DC, direct current power supply. It takes 100 to 240 volts AC at 1.2 amps at 50 or 60 hertz and converts it to 24 volts direct VDC at two and a half amps. Simply a fancy voltage transformer that powers the case controllers and the accessories as well. Big retailers would like to be able to replace old refrigerated cases, remodel, or do a startup very quickly with as little as one day turnaround or even less. In order to do this, controllers need to be pre-programmed with application information, set points, refrigerant in the system, defrost details, and so on. This has been coordinated with case equipment manufacturers for the pre-programming, -pre implementation, testing, startup, and the end result being cool, cold, or frozen product ready to sell to customers in the shortest amount of time. Now to do this, case location becomes pretty critical. Some cases are essentially duplicates of one another, except for some application details. In order to meet any of these quick turnaround startup goals, cases need to be placed in their assigned locations with the correct programming in place. Otherwise, changes will need to be made in the field and that'll take time. This diagram shows the big picture with connections between the building automation system and the individual case controllers. The RS-485 connections are made between the rack controllers and to the lead case on a communication loop. Case-to-case -case connections are made with the appropriate CAT5, 6, or 7 cables. And we'll talk more about communication loops right now. Here is additional detail showing the connections between the building automation system here, the gateway routers, cellular gateways on a diagram are simply sometimes referred to as cellular gateways in the individual cases. So we've shown two different locations for a router that's gonna allow and provide for remote control and monitoring. Note there are length limitations between cases. A network switch, which is another type of router, can act as a necessary booster if the cable length exceeds 328 feet, which we've shown right here. Also note those options for the cellular gateways, also known as a router. And I pointed those out just a moment ago. Now, there is a limit of 38 or less cases per communication loop. We specify that right here. And that has something to do with the brand of the building automation system. So that's something that will be specified by that manufacturer. Most building automation systems have four or more communication loop connection points. Here is a detailed view of a lineup. For example, the dairy case lineup can have a maximum of eight shared cases. That's depicted here. These cases would then subsequently have the same defrost settings, same evaporator pressure and temperature control. Here is an even more detailed example of the communication loop and the lineup with everything from dairy cases, meat cases, and even remote condensing units being depicted. With a gateway portal in place, we can remotely view process values, view and edit set points, pull data logs, and assist in troubleshooting any control issues. The gateway router, as depicted here, would normally include a location or store number, the gateway serial number, and a number for the respective technical support team that would be responsive for this. This setup can provide for remote access and control via the internet. Here's another option. With an iPhone app, we can provide an easy access point for technicians at a store location. This can also assist with limited troubleshooting activities. 
This will provide a way for the technician to view current operational values and set points and a number of different manufacturers have this capability. Now here's an overview or summary of what we've discussed regarding controllers. Temperature control, superheat control, EEPR control, fan control, defrost, liquid line solenoid valve control, lighting control, the list just goes on. Build temp case control, data interface, local user interface, diagnostics, fail safe, fail safe operations. These things are pretty neat and they're getting widespread use. It's good to know about them. Now, just so you know, Sporland can supply to you free of charge, everything from educational packets, pocket cards, quick tip booklets, pressure temperature charts, wall posters, and countermats, and a whole lot more. Or you can readily view and download product bulletins and literature at solutions.parker.com slash literature. Now, Sporland's always here to assist you with your air conditioning and refrigeration flow control needs. You can reach us by calling the general number for Sporland headquarters at 636 area code 239-1111. You can also dial tech support directly at 636 area code 392-3906. You can also send an email to SVD tech support at parker.com and get support for a host of all the products that we manufacture and supply to the industry. And of course, we're always available 24-7 at sporland.com. You can visit us there. You can go to Facebook, Twitter, and see our YouTube videos for our stash of training videos and webinars. This concludes our presentation on methods to electronically control refrigerated cases. Thank you for joining us.